ok the next is about the alcoholic liver disorders among the alcoholic liver disorders of course alcoholism can present with the one the acute alcoholic intoxication in the acute alcoholic intoxication the problems which occur would be the medical issues which are there would be quite many not related to limited to the liver pathologies and it could be like uh, the patients may have all that uh, complications like confusion super or even coma or death also can occur of course there can be an acute hepatitis alcoholic hepatitis can be precipitated but th that issue is something different which we will not deal with in detail we will go into the other the issue the alcoholic liver disorders where the impairment of the functions of the liver due to the alcohol is to be con considered now alcoholic uh, liver disorders again can be categorized into mainly three categories alcoholic fatty liver or steatosis or alcoholic hepatitis and alcohol related cirrhosis the same is described in sushura as panatya paramada panajena and panabhibhram panatya is acute intoxication paramada panajena and panabhibhram these are suggestive of the long term consequences of the same alcoholism that's the exactly the issues now the uh, in general when a person is uh, addicted to alcohol it can result in any of these issues like uh, a steatosis it can result in a state of hepatitis see there could be initially a fatty changes and then fatty changes can result in a hepatic hepatitis and it it also can result in cirrhosis or cirrhosis may directly occur in the situations and it may end up in hepatocellular carcinoma so in uh, alcoholism the ultimate would be the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and cirrhosis is the next irreversible complication at this stage the where the patient has a steatosis alone but there is only a fatty changes in the liver are there it is claimed to be reversible but later on from this stage onwards the changes which occur would be irreversible the changes which occur the uh, liver injury due to the alcohol is due to its metabolism the metabolism of alcohol is a, uh, instead of uh, the glucose metabolism now in the normal the energy is produced by the glucose metabolism where glucose is converted into carbon dioxide and water and the energy is released in the form of uh, atp so oxidized energy in case of uh, alcohol when the alcohol is consumed the alcohol would undergo the metabolic cycle and particularly when the liver doesn't have sufficient glucose see if there is a plenty of glucose there is always a preference for the metabolism to occur in the glucose only with the glucose only but if the glucose is not sufficient or quantity of the alcohol is more than that of the glucose in the body in that situation there would be a rapid metabolic process of the alcohol and the alcohol metabolism ends up in acetaldehyde it's not carbon dioxide it's a incompletely oxidized uh, substance acetaldehyde would occur and acetaldehyde uh, production would result in the reduced energy nadh2 nadh2 and that reduced energy can be a cause for the oxidative stress over the tissue the tissue can become injured the cells of the liver can be injured at the more and at the same time acetaldehyde also had will end up in formation of uh, lipids see acetaldehyde as such it cannot remain in the body it will result in formation of the lipids and these lipids tend to get stored in the liver and that's what how we call as a, the steatosis or a fatty liver changes the liver would have more and more fatty tissues and once there is a fatty tissue in the liver then the capacity of the liver tissues to function would be gradually reduced the hepatocytes number could be reduced and functional capacity is reduced and hence it gradually leads to a liver failure or a pro progression of the liver cell failure moreover the there could be a direct injury to the hepatocytes too the acetaldehyde also can injure the liver cells and that injury to the liver cells also can affect the functions of the liver particularly when the liver cells are injured the transaminase enzymes would be released into the body and the transmination function would be affected so in this way the alcohol can affect the total liver functions as such now who has given certain guidelines about the alcoholism and uh, uh, there are of course i would not fully agree with this but as a physician we should know about 
what the WHO says about it. The alcoholism and alcohol intake, uh, such alcohol fatty disorder. The guidelines given by the WHO are the minimum amounts of alcohol intake associated with increased risk of alcoholic liver disorder range from 40 to 80 grams per day for 10 to 12 years. Safe limits of alcohol are not clearly defined. So, that there is a, a version like there is a safe limit of the alcohol, but I would say that there is nothing like a safe limit of the alcohol. Alcohol consumed even once can produce the same effects as such, and hence it is always better to avoid the alcohol than to say certain limit is safe. Then the other is genetics play a role in alcohol consumption and alcoholism. This is one of the versions of the WHO, like there are certain genetic predisposition for alcoholism as well as alcoholic liver disorder and uh, they are related to the hepatic enzymes and the, now they say that it can be even identified like uh, the, with the cytochrome P450 system uh, that can be the, one of the uh, mechanisms by which uh, alcoholic predisposition can be identified. Then several studies have demonstrated high prevalence of hepatitis C virus antibody in patients with alcoholic virus uh, as well as iron overload. Now hepatitis C virus and alcoholism they are related but exactly how they are related is not known but uh, from a WHO guideline point of view there is a possible correlation whether C, hepatitis C virus precipitates alcoholic liver disorder or alcoholism makes the liver susceptible to C virus uh, hepatitis. This question is not yet fully answered, but this correlation should be known as such. Then obesity and dietary habits have been implicated in individual susceptible alcohol disorder. Now, whether a person has to be considered as an alcoholic or not, to confirm about that again, the WHO has given a standardized reference questionnaire, and with this questionnaire, you are supposed to score the person, and that score is called as ADD score or alcohol user disorder identification uh, this uh, test as such and this is based upon the question of like how often do you have a drink containing alcohol how many units of alcohol you drink in a typical day when you are drinking and based upon that number you will be giving the scores and there are 10 questions ultimately and based upon these questions the scores are given and based upon these scores the risk of alcoholism or alcoholic liver disorder are mentioned like uh, at the audit scores based upon that audit scores. A, a score of 1 to 7 is considered to be low risk drinkers and uh, scores of 8 to 15 are hazardous drinkers. Score of 16 to 19 are harmful drinkers. 20 to 40 are alcohol dependence and based upon this the strategy is suggested and the strategy of how to deal with such persons, alcoholism persons. So, there are two issues, one dealing with the alcoholism and the other is alcoholic liver disorder. Now before going into the liver disorder, I would like to have some idea about how to deal with that, universal guidelines about how to deal with the alcoholism. Now, the, uh, the generally, the other way, the categorization of the same score system is also categorized as three low risk and moderate risk and high risk categories. And in the low risk categories where the score is 0 to 7, the protocol suggests like provide advice on alcohol and its effects and harm reduction to prevent intoxication so that the, it has to be regulated. Then the score 8 to 12 in that condition, the you have to assess the risk of withdrawal. There is a possibility of a risk in withdrawal and it's always better to have the withdrawal and assess for other health and psychological, psychosocial issues, provide advice on alcohol and effects of harm and uh, include, include the family as appropriate. Then score 13, it is uh, the independent dependence. In that condition, morbidity assessment has to be assessed and all possible uh, risks also of withdrawal has to be assessed and uh, if necessary, the vitamin supplement has to be uh, assessed and the psychosocial problems also have to be assessed as such. Now, that is about the issue. Now, we will not go in much into that part. We will directly get into the alcoholic hepatitis. Now, when to call as a alcoholic hepatitis, alcoholism patient, how to identify that alcoholism hepatitis, alcoholic hepatitis. This again is a quite varying degree of issues. Now, uh, there is a universal uh, consensus 
you know, see the to confirm when the con- patient has to be considered as alcoholic hepatitis, when it has to be considered as only alcoholic steatosis. This question is always difficult to answer. A steatosis or the fatty changes in the liver can be made out with the, the ultrasonography and many a times they will be clinically uh, silent. It's not clearly made out. And many a times the identification is based upon only the biochemical studies and hence in that condition to make out whether the patient has to be categorized as alcoholic hepatitis or not because the issue has also relationship with the, the insurance claims and so on. Patients who are diagnosed as alcoholic hepatitis may not get the insurance claim easily and hence all these factors have to be considered before you make a diagnosis of an alcoholic hepatitis and the universal consensus definition. Now, this uh, uh, consensus definition of alcoholic hepatitis is uh, on the diagnostic criteria of jaundice onset with the, uh, within previous eight weeks and history of long-term consumption of alcohol for more than 40 grams uh, per day and or three standard drinks daily for women or 60 grams of roughly four standard drinks daily for men. So there is some criteria of how far this uh, uh, the content or has to be assessed and less than 60 days of abstinence before onset of jaundice. So if the person has uh, stopped drinking for 60 days and then the jaundice has occurred, it may not be considered as uh, alcoholic hepatitis. And the other biochemical criteria is uh, AST has to be more than 50 units and uh, the a- AST ALT ratio should be more than 1.5. That's something which we have discussed in the previous session, the ratio of uh, the ASDO to SDPT and the total bilirubin should be more than 3 mg per DL then we consider it as a alcohol, uh, alcoholic hepatitis. In addition to this, the other uh, factors which may be related to are possible ischemic hepatitis due to severe gastrointestinal tract bleeding, hypotension, cocaine use, these also have to be ruled out and metabolic liver disorder like Wilson disease and uh, drug induced liver diseases are uh, uncertain alcohol use assessment in patient and a patient is denying the excess of alcohol use. These are the conditions which you have to rule out before you make the diagnosis of alcoholic hepatitis. So making a diagnosis of alcohol hepatitis has a, not only the medical uh, issue, it also has some legal issues because once you make the diagnosis of alcoholic hepatitis, there will be many other related legal issues like insurance claim, like accident claim and so on. So in such issues, you have to be careful and we should follow the universal guidelines. That consensus definition has to be followed. That's important. Otherwise, it can be leading to some other troubles. Of course, practically from the clinical treatment point of view, it may not be an issue. But from the other way, it's an issue of making the diagnosis. Of course, uh, the Madhakeya definition is exactly the same. The symptoms will be Trishnatha, Daha, Jara, Swera, Moha, Atisara, Vindumi, Vidyad, Harita, Varna, Sepitta, Prayam. That uh, Pitraja Madhakeya is a, can be considered as alcoholic hepatitis. Now, the symptoms which are produced in alcoholic hepatitis, classical symptoms of alcoholic hepatitis and alcoholic liver disorders. Now, these names, alcoholic liver hepatitis and alcoholic uh, liver disorder, these names also have some clinical significance. When you say alcoholic hepatitis, it's a short duration and usually uh, we, along with the, the presented jaundice. Alcoholic liver disorder is a chronic one, long term uh, uh, condition where there is a deposition of the fat and whether the jaundice is present or not is not a criteria. But in case of alcoholic hepatitis, the uh, duration is short and it's always accompanied the pain in the right upper quadrant because of the inflammatory changes and anorexia, fatigue and jaundice as such, peripheral other symptoms which could occur could be nausea, vomiting, peripheral neuropathy as in any other cases of the hepatitis like condition. The only difference is uh, in a viral hepatitis, the uh, levels of uh, AST would be quite high like thousands whereas in case of transhumanist enzymes in uh, Viral hepatitis will vary high, whereas in alcoholic uh, conditions it will be comparatively lower, but at the range of maybe a 52 or uh, uh, 200 to 300 units of AST and ALT, which is comparatively lower, middle range, 
and SGLT ratio is about 1.5 whereas in case of viral hepatitis it will be very high like 2 to 3 so that is how the differentiation made out and total bilirubin should be more than 3 milligrams then uh, there should be also albumin function or pre-albumin should be lesser than normal so that's uh, the confirmation of the alcoholic hepatitis in alcoholic hepatitis synthetic functions should be affected whereas in case of viral hepatitis albumin need not be i don't say albumin will not be but albumin need, need not be reduced as such then the other uh, findings which are other tests which are necessary or which are often seen in case of alcoholic hepatitis are elevated uh, INR ratio that is the bleeding time the tendency to have the bleeding would be uh, uh, there in alcoholic hepatitis of course in viral hepatitis also it may be but in alcoholic hepatitis the incidence is more and the blood cell count also may be raised with the neutrophilic uh, prominence and uh, Thiamine deficiency, thrombocytopenia and vitamin B12 deficiencies also may coexist in case of alcoholic hepatitis. Of course, these may be presented, that deficiencies may be presented even in a viral hepatitis. So, that is not the diagnostic criteria, but these are the other tests which are required in a case of alcoholic hepatitis. Principle of the management of alcoholic hepatitis is that one is you have to assess the disease severity and if it is a severe uh, one, uh, then the, you have to follow the lines of the either a, a administration of the corticosteroids or pentoxifilin. This is the contemporary line of treatment. Whereas if it is mild to moderate, then you have to try only the conservative treatment where the general treatment of maintenance of the diet, alcoholic abstinence, uh, providing nutrition and uh, uh, alcohol withdrawal symptoms when the patient uh, withdrawal alcohol is withdrawn there could be symptoms of uh, anxiety and then maybe at times uh, irritability those may have to be needed so that's about uh, the general principles of the management of a mind to moderate alcohol hepatitis but if the patient is having very severe condition then the one major choice is uh, corticosteroids and or if the patient uh, doesn't have a, a, a patient has a contraindication for steroid administration due to other reasons then pentoxifilin is the other choice pentoxifilin is a highly toxic drug and the relation this uh, outcome is not very predictable corticosteroids are usually here and if the corticosteroid shows good response continue corticosteroids for at least two to three months or till the patient has a uh, uh, complete relief. If the steroids also do not help or do not show the response, then the patient has to be planned for a transplantation. This is the general protocol of treatment. From Ayurvedic point of view, from my clinical experience point of view, I would treat the patients of mild to moderate conditions with Aragyogini, Kamadiva, Kumali, Asava, and a patient can be, you know, alcohol can be withdrawn very safely. At, if at all the patients have the symptoms of anxiety or irritability, it can be managed with this Mitsagaradasa temporarily for one or two weeks and with this acute alcoholic hepatitis with the mind to moderate severity can be managed. But very severe conditions, the management will be difficult. So that is about the alcoholic hepatitis as one of the complications of alcoholism or alcoholic liver disorder. The next is about alcoholic fatty liver changes. Now fatty liver again mechanism we have already discussed like how the fatty deposition occurs and the fatty liver can be graded into five grades like uh, or four grades as such like grade one where there is a simple fat and uh, fatty liver changes can occur as a consequence of the alcohol as well as uh, there are now the incidences of uh, fatty liver changes produced due to uh, conditions other than that of the alcohol non-alcoholic fatty liver disorders also now are increasing in number and it is one of the very serious issue now uh, alcoholic fatty issue is a well known well established identity but non-alcoholic fatty liver disorder is a very serious issue of the present day and it is increasing in number and many times the exact causes are not known or many of these are related to the lifestyle i will come to that part now grade 2 is when there is a fatty liver changes plus there is an inflammation and that is what 
and in ultrasonography this can be made out uh, and uh, uh, it's also called uh, na, or it could be non alcoholic state of hepatitis nas is a non alcoholic state of hepatitis also could be the alcoholic or non alcoholic and it's a claim that till these stages they are reversible and grade 3 is liver fibrosis and grade 4 is the cirrhosis fatty changes can refer to cirrhosis the word cirrhosis suggests that there is a degeneration fibrosis and regeneration all the three components are there so clinically cirrhosis is categorized as a separate entity though it's a consequence of the fatty liver conditions till that stage of liver fibrosis we consider this as a the fatty liver disorder so that's the nomenclature, the present nomenclature is in it like that. Now, the fatty liver changes will show, if at all you go for biochemical analysis of the liver tissues, the liver tissue will show decrease in mitochondrial fatty with oxidation, the mitochondrial uh, functions will be affected, and the endogenous fatty acid synthesis also can be enhanced, and deficient carbonation of uh, triglycerides can occur. Now, these are the pathological forces which can be proved or demonstrated by a thorough biochemical assessment, which practically we don't do. The real causes of the fatty changes can be, fatty liver changes can be identified into three categories where the fatty deposition has occurred due to either mitochondrial changes or due to increase in endogenous uh, fatty acid synthesis or deficient uh, this incorporation of a triglyceride metabolism where lipoprotein would be raised. Now, these are the three possible mechanisms of the fatty liver changes, which practically in the routine clinical practice, we don't give much attention to it. And even from the management point of view, they have very little issue, uh, little consequence, except for the fact that in the two categories, the dietary restrictions, so the two next two categories, the dietary restrictions can have a significant more benefit, rather they may be more beneficial than the first category where mitochondrial changes are occurred. Now, fatty liver changes can be graded easily with the ultrasonography and there is a standard protocol of grading the ultrasonography into three grades, like fatty liver with the increased liver ecogenicity and grade two is fatty liver with the ecogenic liver obscuring the ecogenic walls, that's uh, the or uh, portal venous uh, branches, they are not seen, that's the second category. And grade 3 is a fatty liver with the uh, significant uh, obstruction or obscure in the upper, the surface characters of the liver. So, the surface would be irregular and hence the diaphragmatic surface is not elevated or uh, cured. So, grading of uh, fatty liver is mainly based upon ultrasonography uh, findings and uh, uh, clinically, the clinical symptoms may not be directly related to the grades many times. So, grading you have to depend upon the ultrasonography only and that's a better way of making the diagnosis. Now, as we have discussed about that uh, uh, issues of alcoholic and non-alcoholic. Now, from the current uh, uh, practical clinical point of view, alcoholic hepatitis of course is one of the issue, but non-alcoholic uh, hepatitis and non-alcoholic liver disorder, fatty liver disorder. These are the two issues of more concern now than really the other issue because the incidence is increasing rapidly and many times the real causes are not found. From the exact clinical point of view that steatohepatitis and fatty liver disorders, they are categorized into two categories based upon the variation in the clinical outcome. The fatty liver disorder would be a chronic condition and uh, usually it, it will have a less severe outcome. That's the patient may have uh, survived for a longer duration and the complications may not be seen much. Whereas hepatitis, state of hepatitis, where the show course is relatively shorter and the outcome would be more severe and most frequently that state of hepatitis results in cirrhosis. Whereas a fatty liver disorder, it will end up in cirrhosis, but it takes a very long time and some of the patients may escape that. So, what happens is practically, you will have plenty of patients who come with that ultrasonography findings, suggestive of fatty changes in the liver. Now, and they will be asking for opinion like what to do. Some of the patients, we can just say that you don't have to worry, you just maintain the lifestyle, advice about the lifestyle and diet would be enough. There is no question of any curative treatment in that condition. 
and uh, whereas in certain conditions the outcome can be poor. So to predict that you have to depend upon these clinical signs and the clinical evidences are uh, in case of uh, the state of hepatitis. In alcoholic conditions of course you have the history of alcohol and you do not have <coughs> much of an issue in the making the diagnosis. But non-alcoholic conditions the patient when <coughs> has the signs of uh, inflammation, liver inflammation where the transaminase levels are relatively raised and there is tenderness in the right side that suggests you have a state of hepatitis and uh, uh, this uh, it also has a fat accumulation and along with that there could be the symptoms like fatigue, swelling of the abdomen and ascites, enlarged blood vessels and so on. Whereas in case of a fatty liver disorder, many a times the symptoms may be asymptomatic and mild pain, rarely there could be tenderness at the right side. Incidence of these are now increasing very rapidly throughout as it in globe and particularly in western countries the incidence of fatty liver changes due to non-alcoholic conditions also are increasing very rapidly and hence it is considered to be a major health concern of the future as such. So lots of research is going on, lots of and virtually there is no curative treatment till now except for the liver transplantation. Now in uh, the in general the conditions which can trigger the patient non-alcoholic fatty liver changes are insulin resistance, obesity, drugs and diet, genetic factors, cytokine dysregulation, cytokine dysregulation which has occurred in the COVID now very recently with the after COVID, post COVID uh, that fatty liver disorders have increased very significantly. Then oxidative stress also is another factor which has increased that non-alcoholic fatty liver disorder. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disorders is a very serious issue and it's uh, now data says that uh, one out of four people with the have non-alcoholic fatty liver disorder regardless of the weight that's the important issue so almost one in four uh, have some uh, evidence of fatty changes in the liver now which is attributed to the lifestyle which is attributed to the diet and particularly in the diet that junk food is considered to be one of the most important triggering factors for the uh, fatty liver changes and lack of exercise lack of exercise is the other cause so exercise at the diet are the most important uh, part of the uh, health and when they are neglected you will have plenty of other disorders. Now at the end every disorder would be ending up in uh, the diet and uh, the exercise as such. And uh, the other way is more than 60 diabetics and 9 severe obese people out of 10 have these uh, alcoholic liver, uh, this non-alcoholic fatty liver changes. So, non-alcoholic fatty liver disorder has become a quite serious issue. Well-known medicines, medications which are induced, which are known to induce the non-alcoholic liver disorders are non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and among them paracetamol is one. I repeat paracetamol is number one drug which produces, which increases the chances of non-alcoholic fatty liver disorder and now there is a very uh, cult of using this paracetamol like you use the salt in the food for every active uh, this disease you take dolo and that dolo is th that irregular hazardous consumption of the paracetamol is now considered to be number one factor remember this it's the number one factor globally for the uh, NAFND and any other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in due course can result in the uh, liver disorder and this is uh, totally avoidable. See, the issue is uh, that kind of irrational use of that drug can be totally avoidable. And unfortunately, paracetamol is still categorized as a safe drug in India and it is sold over the uh, outside the counter. Like, and anybody, any can, anyone can buy that paracetamol easily and uh, it has become a cult as such. So, that's uh, one of the serious issue. And along with that, the other drugs like anti tuberculosis like isoniazid, anti-epileptic drugs like vaporic acid, antibiotic like erythromycin, amoxicillin also can result in liver disorder, antifungal drugs like ketoconazole also can result in liver disorder. This of course is a comparatively not a very huge issue but still have some clinical significance. Uh, paracetamol it has to be well known. Now to differentiate between alcoholic hepatitis and cirrhosis, the next change that would be, again these are all technical issues of how to differentiate that. 
it's mainly based upon the issue of in a cirrhosis patients the duration is longer they, and whereas uh, in alcoholic hepatitis it has to be for a two months minimum uh, history and uh, in case of alcoholic that jaundice hepatitis the jaundice would be of recent onset whereas cirrhosis it could be long term transaminase level is quite important the issue, uh, in case of uh, hepatitis conditions alcoholic hepatitis conditions the levels of transaminase are raised and the ratio is uh, more than 1.5 whereas uh, in case of uh, cirrhosis transaminase levels may be spine uh, normal or very little normal uh, are within normal limits and the ratio is less than 1.5 that's important that uh, ASTLT ratio is quite significant to make out the diagnosis of cirrhosis and hepatitis in case of hepatitis that ratio is enhanced viral hepatitis the ratio is significantly enhanced and uh, in case of uh, uh, these uh, cirrhosis it may not be enhanced or it may be even on the lower side then bilirubin levels in cirrhosis can be very it may be any of the patients of cirrhosis may not have jaundice bilirubin level may be normal till very late stages and uh, the stigma of cirrhosis stigma of cirrhosis i will come to that at the end of this discussion we will have that like ascites uh, and uh, the uh, this vascular changes over the surface we will come to that part and they are seen in ascites as such now cirrhosis as such is the next condition for fatty changes there is no question of any curative treatment all that treatment would be prevention of the alcohol and maintenance of the diet and exercise so that you will not have that further worsening but cirrhosis as such is the condition where there will be a fibrosis as well as regeneration so initially fatty changes resulting in fibrosis and regeneration degeneration fibrosis and regeneration these three components together are called as a cirrhosis based upon the macroscopic appearance as well as the microscopic changes produced cirrhosis is categorized into two categories macronodular and micronodular macro and micronodular is based upon the damage which occurs at the hepato hepatic nodules in case of micronodular changes that hepatic lobules the there will be a degeneration in the central area of the uh, lobule and hence uh, the it gets shrunken porta hepatis the surrounding structures they would be you know, they would uh, uh, maintain their relationship with the nodules whereas in the macronodule the peri changes which occur would be more in the periphery degeneration and fibrosis occurs in the periphery and the shape of the hepatic lobule is lost instead of the typical hexagonal the shape may be altered and the relationship with the porta hepatis is uh, lost and hence the nodules become bigger in cross if at all you look at the surface of the liver macronodular surface would be showing that irregular surface raised surface and the liver may be really enlarged in a micronodular surface uh, the liver the surface may remain smooth and the liver may be shrunken instead of that the causes for the cirrhosis is not only about the alcohol see when we discuss about the cirrhosis of course we started from alcoholic uh, liver disorder but alcohol is not the only criteria or cause for that cirrhosis can occur due to multiple other factors and those are you may hepatitis of various conditions toxic substances like uh, carbon tetrachloride mushroom etc deposition disorders like wilson's disease or drugs many of the drugs like uh, acetaminophen the acetaminophen is uh, the paracetamol uh, or methyl dopa and uh, the uh, drug induced or uh, medically induced tryptogenic is uh, medically induced hereditary conditions alcohol of course in late stages it can present in alcohol can present with the macro or micronodular cirrhosis both these forms can occur most of the macronodular cirrhosis are produced due to toxic conditions or infective conditions whereas uh, micronodular are uh, either primary bilateral cirrhosis that congenital bilateral cirrhosis or uh, patients who have an obstructive pathology and later have developed this uh, cirrhosis or patients who have hemolytic jaundice and which has resulted in cirrhosis or like indian childhood cirrhosis which is a, a, a we will have some discussion about that issue maybe later and patients who have cystic fibrosis or patients who have undergone intestinal surgery it often results in micronodular the outcome of a <coughs> micronodular cirrhosis is a, a worse than macronodular cirrhosis in general 
the manifestations clinical manifestations of the cirrhosis could be of many see cirrhosis is a syndrome where there will say changes in the liver but clinical presentation of that would be of different varieties and from the clinic, clinical point of view we will deal with the patients of cirrhosis for any of these reasons like a portal hypertension or hepatic encephalopathy or hepatorenal syndrome or hematological manifestations or at the end the uh, cirrhosis may end up in hepatocellular carcinoma or cholangio carcinoma malignant changes or pulmonary and cardiac changes due to cirrhosis would occur. So we will go into each of these individually uh, as we deal with the clinical conditions. Of course, cirrhosis as a whole, it involves any of these. A patient of cirrhosis may present with any one of these or all of these or a few of these uh, complications. So from the clinical management point of view, we will discuss these individually. The first is the portal hypertension. Portal hypertension means the increased pressure in the portal circulation. Portal vessels, they are, now we use the term portal because uh, when the blood passes through more than one uh, network of venules, that's called as a portal system. The word portal system is, uh, see usually the blood enters from the artery to the veins and from the veins again it gets back to the heart and then goes back. But if at all, the blood entering from artery to the veins uh, through the capillaries uh, would again have another network where the again the vein would again convert into or it, it will flow into another network of capillaries and again it enters in. So more than one capillary network being filtered is uh, the portal system. The portal system would be present elsewhere too. It's not only the uh, hepatic area or the liver. The portal system also is present in the pituitary, portal system also is present in the kidneys, but these are not named as portal vessels, but they are considered as the portal systems of those individual organs. In the liver or the portal vessel, when we say a portal vein, it always represents the vein in the abdomen, that abdominal circulation where the circulation in the liver is concerned. Now the circulation in the liver is the food and the other substances which are uh, absorbed from the mesenteric vessels from the gastrointestinal tract, stomach and duodenum, they enter into the liver and, uh, and in the liver it gets again circulated and uh, from the liver the blood gets into the uh, hepatic vein, the central vein, from there it goes into the systemic circulation. The purpose of the portal vein is uh, mainly two aspects. One, when the food is absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract, there could be many toxic substances which could be absorbed because the absorption is uh, somewhat passive and these toxic substances should not enter into the system and uh, to prevent that the portal system would be protecting like because the blood flows through the liver mainly these toxic substances are uh, prevented and the most important critical toxic substance is ammonia. Ammonia gas is produced regularly in the gastrointestinal tract during the metabolism or digestion and the ammonia is converted into urea by the liver by combining with the, the carbon dioxide that uh, creates a hans lead cycle, creates a hans lead cycle, carbon, uh, ammonia and the molecule of carbon dioxide result in the urea and that urea is excreted through the kidneys. This is the normal mechanism of the detoxification. Of course, it's not only the ammonia. If there are hundreds of substances which could be nucleated by the liver, so portal circulation is absolutely essential to prevent the toxic effects of the food digestion. So during the digestion of the food, lots of other fermentation products, lots of other toxic substances could be produced, but those toxic substances do not produce a harmful effect on the body because it passes through the blood passes through the liver. At the same time, the nourishment, the other nourishments which are absorbed, they too have to undergo the metabolic changes by which it can be used in the body and those metabolic changes would occur in the liver. So from the detoxification as well as the metabolic activity, portal circulation is important. And the dynamics of the portal circulation is such that the pressure in the portal vessel is slightly more than that of the systemic pressure and hence the blood will flow from the portal circulation, portal system to the venous system. So there is always a pressure gradient and the pressure gradient is around 3 to 4 millimeters of mercury or 1 to 5 millimeters of mercury. 
Now, if that pressure gradient is uh, increased, like the difference between the pressure of the systemic vessel and the portal vessel increases on the positive side, that the portal vessel pressure is uh, becoming uh, lesser than that of the systemic vein, and hence there is a backflow of the blood. So that pressure difference is uh, more. So backflow of the blood from the systemic wheel into the portal vein, and the pressure increases, and then is considered to be a portal with uh, hypertension. And when the pressure gradient is more than 6 mm of mercury, then there is always a disc, uh, risk of disease progression and uh, uh, it can, uh, it suggests you have a possible worsening of the condition. Patient may not be having a clinically significant issue. So, so from the your surgical point of view, this is significant. When the pressure is more than 10 millimeters, then only you will have a significant portal hypertension evidences. Till about 10 millimeters, clinically the symptoms may not be seen as such. When the pressure increases to 12 mm, there is a risk of rupture of the varices, esophageal varices. Now, once the portal hypertension occurs, the consequence will be the portocable anastomotic vessels, the vessels which are connected to or which are related to the combination or maybe the uh, association of the systemic vessel and uh, the portal vessel, they tend to get dilated. And the most important portocable anastomotic vessels are in the lower end of the esophagus and in the rectum, the iris, and as well as the superior surface of the liver, the diaphragmatic surface of the liver. Among them, the quite significant clinically would be the esophageal vessels. Esophageal beans, they tend to get dilated due to that increased pressure and hence that dilated vessels, they become varicosities and they may get rupture and rupture of the esophageal varices is one of the critical complications of the portal hypertension where there could be sudden bleeding. And the rectal vessels can result in hemorrhoids, but for the hemorrhoids, the portal hypertension being a cause for the hemorrhoids is only about 3%. In 97% of the patients, the hemorrhoids do occur due to other causes. So, that's the other way. And the bleeding, of course, from the hemorrhoids do can occur in case of the portal hypertension. When the pressure is more than 16 millimeters of mercury, that pressure gradient is more than 16 millimeters of mercury, then there is a high risk of mortality. Usually, it, it, the treatment would be considered to be a, a very high, that uh, mortality is very high and virtually hopeless conditions. Practically, when the pressure is more than 20 millimeters of mercury, no treatment can help and it's a, it results in acute bleeding as such. Portal hypertension can be produced due to other reasons also, not only cirrhosis, the other reasons and based upon that, the portal hypertensions are categorized into post-hepatic, Prehepatic and intrahepatic conditions. Intrahepatic conditions and the uh, uh, intrahepatic conditions are uh, the real cirrhotic conditions. Cirrhosis will produce the changes in the uh, sinusoids, and there again, based upon the issue uh, location of the diamet, they may be considered as pre sinusoidal, sinusoidal, and post sinusoidal. Cirrhosis often presents with the, uh, alcoholic cirrhosis presents with the the pre sinusoidal and the sinusoidal uh, uh, complications. Post sinusoidal is usually in case of the infective pathology like uh, hepatitis, which results in macronodular. Alcoholic conditions often result in micro or macronodular cirrhosis. Then the other post hepatic conditions where the pressure is in the systemic vein is enhanced due to the obstruction that is in Burchieri syndrome and the hepatic vein. Burchieri syndrome is obstruction to the hepatic vein or inferior venical obstructions or pericarditis or uh, heart failure like conditions can result in a post-hepatic uh, uh, cirrhosis, whereas pre-hepatic cirrhosis could occur due to thrombosis, portal venal thrombosis or a splenic vein thrombosis. They are different from cirrhosis. But cirrhosis as a clinical presentation and sorry, portal hypertension as a clinical presentation can occur due to the other causes too and the clinical presentation can be similar. Uh, the only the, uh, difference is when you deal with the patient of portal hypertension, you need to identify the cause and the uh, approach to the management would be based upon these causes. Now, to diagnose a portal hypertension, the essential clinical criteria is that uh, there has to be a splenomegaly, 
that's important without splenomegaly you will not make the diagnosis of portal hypertension except in case of splenic vein thrombosis in a splenic vein thrombosis splenomegaly is not a rule then the other is esophageal varices ascites as well as if at all there is evidence of portocaval collaterals portocaval collaterals are seen in the form of a bulging of umbilical vein the caput medusae sign seen around the umbilicus the dilated vessels around the umbilicus are the other criteria so clinical signs of portal hypertension are mainly these and uh, the clinical presentation of a uh, portal hypertension is mainly the most important is uh, from the gat bleeding the bleeding from the esophageal varices which could be either acute or chronic now other uh, conditions which can present with the cirrhosis and non cirrhotic portal hypertension the conditions which you have to consider before you make uh, once you have made the diagnosis of portal hypertension the conditions which you have to uh, rule out are uh, before you make a condition diagnosis of cirrhosis alcoholic cirrhosis the non alcoholic conditions are there could be a situation where portal hypertension can occur even without the cirrhosis the conditions like uh, hepatitis b and c and steroid uh, fatty disorders can also result in uh, portal hypertension even before the cirrhosis has occurred uh, wilson's disease primary biliary cirrhosis can also be the other causes which you have to rule out esophageal varices which can be made out with the endoscopy gastroscopy or barium meal swallow x ray so to confirm that uh, esophageal varices you need to use a gastroscope esophagoscope can make out these and based upon the cbrt we grade them into three grades as this is the third grade grade three where the lumen is obstructed or in a barium swallow x ray these can be seen as a filling defects as such the typical symptoms and signs of the port hypertension are hematemesis or melina and it's suggestive of the same and mental status changes again it's also due to the portal systemic encephalopathy so encephalopathy is another subject which we will deal with but patients have poor portal hypertension they may develop the encephalopathy because of ammonia toxicity as i told you earlier the detoxification of the ammonia is one of the most important detoxification function of the liver and in a patient of portal hypertension the ammonia can reach to the system without being converted or be, before all that ammonia is converted into urea and the presence of ammonia can be very highly toxic to the nerves and hence the patient may have encephalopathy then abdominal girth is increased due to the ascites formation and uh, pain and fever may also suggest of uh, uh, inflammatory pathology like uh, bacterial peritonitis which could also be a complication of uh, the portal uh, hypertension and uh, hematochesia is a uh, bleeding from the uh, uh, this colon where the stools are mixed with the blood which also could be the portal hypertension complications of hemorrhoids then the other signs which i told you that the dilatation of the vessels like uh, the umbilical vessels anterior abdominal valves dilated and uh, venous pattern in the flanks that in the flanks also the vessels may be dilated uh, then caput medusae is the same umbilical veins hemorrhoids ascites paraumbilical hernia can also be a cause uh, presence of the portal hypertension now portal hypertension can result in bleeding and that bleeding will result in a hyperdynamic circulatory state so due to that uh, portal hypertension bleeding could occur which can result in hyperdynamic circulation state and that hyperdynamic circulatory state can present with the clinical symptoms of a, a bounding pulse or palpitation and uh, the uh, warm uh, sweating in the periphery then hypotension and uh, murmur in the pericardium that uh, uh, hemic murmur could be heard due to the bleeding continuous blood loss that could also be a presentation in case of portal hypertension due to the bleeding in relation to the other uh, coexisting symptoms in case of esophageal varices a uh, portal hypertension and esophageal varices can present these signs also are having some significance though they are not the essential signs of uh, the portal hypertension they could be pallor enlargement of the parotid gland which is related to alcohol acid cyanosis of the tongue dyspnea and uh, telangiectasia that is uh, the vessels dilated and uh, liver being si smaller in size as observed in uh, ultrasonography then venous hums uh, seen over the vessels due to low pressure in the veins then tarry stools can occur 
That's about the portal hypertension as such. Treatment for the portal hypertension is mainly uh, based upon the two issues. Oh, of course, we'll. Uh, the, uh, yeah, medical treatment for the portal hypertension is mainly based upon the treatment either to prevent the bleeding or to manage the bleeding further. To prevent the bleeding, the first of the thing is vasopressin is given. Vasopressin is usually the drug of choice and usually given in the form of infusion to even a patient present with the acute bleeding. That's the one lifetime treatment. The other lifetime treatment could be mechanical treatment like uh, uh, this uh, balloon which is used, uh, an endoscopic balloon is inserted and then tamponade producing a compression upon the veins to bleed, stop the bleeding or even now injection therapies, sclerosing substances are injected and hence the varicose veins uh, could be blocked. Uh, that's how the acute bleeding could be prevented. So for the acute bleeding, the treatment could be either vasopressin plus nitroglycerin or uh, telepressin, etc. Then the other preventive treatment would be beta blockers are the usual prescriptions. Beta blocker like uh, propanol are usually prescribed as a preventive so that in the long term the bleeding may not occur. There is no other curative treatment as such. So that's about uh, the issues and the uh, portal hypertension also can result in a gastric pathology. It can result in abnormal function of the stomach and that's again categorized into chronic bleeding, acute bleeding and uh, of course the non-specific symptoms. Now approach there would be to prevention Prevention would be by taking care of the diet as such and uh, in a chronic bleeding you have to supplement the iron as well as the trans transfusion may be required to maintain the hemoglobin level. In the acute bleeding as I told you the same IV fluids as well as uh, the treatment of vasopressin is the treatment. Long term treatment or curative treatment in case of the portal hypertension is by creating bypasses, surgical treatment of bypass where you may create a stent between the systemic vein and the other uh, portal vein. There are many techniques, hepatorenal or hepatosystemic uh, and so on. So, uh, portocaval stunts could be used, different sorts of the stunts are used. So, surgical treatment is the ultimate. From the um, practical clinical point of view, many types of the treatment would be in case of uh, these uh, esophageal viruses. Aragyardini Punanamandala Kumari as given long term can reduce the chances of bleeding. When the patient presents with the bleeding, if there is a very massive bleeding, of course this treatment may not be enough. You need to go for an emergency treatment. But moderate bleeding can be effect, uh, uh, this managed with the Chandrakala Rasa and Ushi Rasava to reduce the bleeding. This is about the portal hypertension. Now we will continue with the further like uh, the hep encephalopathy and other complications of the cirrhosis in due course like so today if at all there is any questions we will try to answer and then we will wind up today there is one question what about uh, sinological findings of uh, liver in elastography oh okay that's fine now to make out the diagnosis of uh, fatty changes the ultrasonography is a comparative order. Newer techniques are elastography. They, there is a new technique called elastography coming up, which is not very uh, easily available and it is considered to be more sensitive than ultrasonography. So, uh, in a high level, you may use that elastography, which gives you the a better evidence of all the fatty changes than ultrasonography. But uh, facility of uh, elastography is not generally easily available in uh, our setup. Maybe you have to go for a higher center for the elastography. It's not yet popular. Maybe in a few years, elastography may become popular. So that's why I have not referred to that issue. Okay, fine. That's one uh, thing which is of important. Uh, then, uh, yeah, then uh, gamma G utilization also is the same issue. It's a very advanced technology which is uh, not easily available. Then uh, the inner question is uh, if we treat ALD with uh, Nitya Virajana. SGOT signs come from normal in seven days. How to assess if it is due to alcohol abstinence or effect of medicine? I think uh, that question by Nitya Virachana, uh, I don't know. So I have not tried that Nitya Virachana in any applications. So uh, that question, I don't know. Uh, so all that I would say, I don't know. But 
See, alcohol abstinence are the effect of medicine. Um, again, that question is comparatively vague. See, if the patient uh, is in an early stage, then the alcohol abstinence can help in reduction of the enzymes. But if the patient is in a relatively later stage, it's about the treatment. So, whether it's due to the treatment or withdrawal, I think it's not possible to answer that question clearly. So, if the patient has uh, clinical relief and the readings are normal, then it should be happy. And you should claim the benefit for your treatment. That's all the point. Huh? Right.